Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's webinar from Coffee Microcaps. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who is joining us uh, this morning for all our regular uh, attendees. Welcome back to our latest event. I'm just going to quickly run through a couple of these uh, intro slides and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank our sponsors for our virtual events, uh, DMX Asset Management. Uh, anybody who's been around the microcap space in Australia for a while uh, will know those guys. Uh, they recently launched a new fund, so be, be sure to uh, head over there and check them out if you haven't uh, already. Uh, quick compliance and disclaimer slide. Uh, for anybody joining us for the first time, the companies we generally have presenting on here are capped under 300 million uh, in revenue and approaching cash flow break even are indeed already profitable, generally from outside the resources and biotech sectors, uh, what I tend to call industrial microcaps, which could be microcap technology, microcap healthcare, microcap financial services, uh, it's basically a catch-all term for Okay, I hope everyone can hear me now. Not sure why we're having technical gremlins this morning. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and I also write a weekly paid subscription newsletter that you can get on the Substack platform. Uh, up first this morning, we've got Mad Paws Holdings. I'm delighted to be joined for uh, first time here at Coffee Microcaps, Justice Hammer, the founder and CEO. And after you assist, then we're going to have Martin Phils back in from Pure Profile, who has presented, I think, maybe twice before. This could be his third time. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I know Justus is waiting patiently there in the wings. So Justus, we're going to start sharing your screen. Yeah, um, one second. And I'll, yeah, it's coming through now. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. All right, welcome everyone, and thanks for having me. Um, I hope you guys watched the tennis as well, and uh, maybe a little bit tired like myself, but amazing match. Um, so, uh, first of all, a couple of words about myself. Uh, my name is Justus. Uh, I've been I'm, I'm the, one of the founders of Madpaws. Uh, I've been involved in startups for the last fifteen plus years uh, here in Australia as well as in Germany. Um, I sold one of my companies to Yahoo7 in 2011, which was a group buying company. And since then been involved in many startups, uh, either as a founder, uh, investor or advisor. And so, you know, I'm very, very passionate about MadPos. Uh, we've started MadPos um, uh, in, in about 2015. And for those of you who are not aware uh, or new to the MadPos story, um, we exist to, um, Let's see if our slides work, but we exist to enable pets to live their life to the fullest. Uh, this is really our purpose for the company and our vision is to become the most trusted and convenient brand to rely on for all pet related needs. And so how do we want to get there? Um, it's quite simple. We started a company uh, as a pure play um, pet services marketplace, and we're now the dominant pet services marketplace in Australia. You can find over 30,000 trusted local pet sitters on our site. Uh, who provide five-star pet sitting, walking, daycare, and grooming services all over, around Australia. So, you know, if you've, you're a pet owner, or maybe you became a pet owner uh, throughout the pandemic, as so many uh, in Australia have been, uh, you'll find uh, somebody to look after your pet when you're going on a holiday or you've gone back to the office. Over the last two years, <laughs> we've been also expanding into other pet offerings. Uh, and we particularly have been using our database of now over 133,000 um, paying customers, uh, which resulted in over 414,000 bookings <coughs> um, for, the, for the company. 
And um, the additional services that we've now been going into include uh, MadPost Food. And you see that here on the left-hand side, these are the, the different verticals uh, that we're starting to target now. MadPost Food, um, we launched in Q1 21. It's uh, a brand called MadPost Dinner Bowl. And it's, uh, a, it's a fresh food um, delivered straight to your door, exactly in the right portion. Um, so it's super convenient uh, and really high quality human grade food, um, which people are looking for now. Um, the second one um, that we added is MadPost Health, where we launched a MadPost insurance offering in Q3 21. And health is really an area that we're really particularly interested in expanding into. Uh, we, we believe that our customer database um, is particularly interested in that space. MadPost Joy is toys and treats. So this was an acquisition that we made in Q4 2021. And um, is, uh, is also a subscription business similar to um, Dinner Bowl. So we provide you with a monthly box that includes toys as well as treats. Um, and is a service that's well loved with customers staying on the service, um, you know, over 15 months on average. And then MadPost Home is the last edition. Um, that's really our curated e-commerce space. We've done a small acquisition in Q2 FY22 uh, with Sash Bads, um, and we see that really picking up. And again, um, everything we're trying to do, every business that we're starting or we're trying to add um, through an acquisition, um, we're adding with the view on how can we use the marketplace as the driving uh, force to accelerate the growth of um, an acquisition or, or an internal build um, that we've been working on. You can see on the bottom, we had over a million pet care services provided. Um, and we've uh, already got a, a, um, a, a great reward for the hard work for, for MadPaws. Uh, dinner bowl with the product uh, review best raw dog food of 2021 um, and uh, we've actually added now uh, the second time that we've got that we actually won best dog uh, best dog uh, the best dog food uh, category from product review for 2022 as well uh, and we're partnering with iconic brands like Qantas who's a who's a shareholder but also a um, we've got a com um, commercial relationship with them the driving customers to our marketplace, uh, obviously a great association and, um, uh, and, and something that really helps us because as you can imagine on the marketplace, when people are thinking travel, um, this is when we want to talk to them and Qantas is, is one of the channels that we're using for that. The pet market has boomed and I'm sure um, you would have read about that or, or experienced it yourself. Um, there's uh, over 30 million pets in Australia now, 69% of households now own a pet, right? So um, we really talk into the majority of households out there, out there in Australia, 6.3 million dogs uh, out there now. Um, and 19% uh, of all those dogs uh, have, um, have got a new owner actually uh, throughout the pandemic. So it's a, it's a huge growth um, and huge tailwinds for us and for the industry. And that's obviously tailwinds that are got here to stay. Um, people are not getting rid of their pets after the pandemic. Um, at least we hope so. We're doing everything that they don't, um, but they want to. They want to look after them, um, and um, and and we're we're here to provide them with services and, and products to do that. Um, you know, interesting um, uh, stats here. Seventy percent of owners say their pets have improved their lives during the pandemic. So this is really um, a, a real feel good industry as well. Uh, uh, pets are obviously here um, uh, significantly in improving our lives and our customers' lives. And um, you know, one of the, one of the things that we've been talking about for years and years is this whole humanization and premiumization of pets. Um, we're for forging more and more human-like relationships with our pets. It's the whole movement from the pets moving from the backyard into the living room into our bedrooms now. <clears throat> and you know, fifty over fifty percent of our customers. Uh, pets now actually sleep with their owners in the bed. So it, it shows you how close the relationship is here. And then <clears throat> just to give you a quick idea on kind of how big the market actually is, um, the Australian pet, mar pet market is huge. Um, we've already talked about, you know, the increase in, in number of pets out there, you know, uh, growing by 30 or 25% um, uh, cats versus dogs. But also 
the amount that people are spending on the dogs has significantly decreased. People now are spending um, over $3,000 on their dogs and over $2,000 on their cats. Um, and if you do the math, that gives you, you know, an implied term of over $13 billion. So um, it's not a small market that's growing. It's a really big market now that's significantly growing faster than, um, uh, than your standard um, industries. And we're already focusing on some of the biggest uh, components of that spend. Right? With, uh, we're now in food, toys, and accessories. Uh, we're starting to go more and more into healthcare um, and uh, vet services as well as insurance. So we're, we're now, with our, industry, with our strategy of using the marketplace to accelerate businesses around, um, um, around us and offering customers, using the data that we have about our customers, to put the right products and services in front of them um, is where we see, you know, huge um, uh, opportunity for us. And um, just wanted to give you a quick overview on kind of how we actually make money as well. Uh, we've got um, already mentioned multiple distinct revenue streams. Um, so we talked about MadPost Care, which is the MadPost marketplace for us. We've got MadPost um, Food with Dinnerball, Health, Pet Insurance, and MadPost Joy with Wagley. And we've actually now got a fifth um, revenue stream with uh, Sash Bats, which is playing in the curated e-commerce space. And just to give you an idea on kind of how we make money in those, um, the left-hand side, the marketplace, is very simple. We're actually um, charging 20% from our sitters um, and 70% as a booking fee of our owners. So if you think about a $100 transaction, sitter wants to charge $100, and um, the sitter would receive $80 of us, we keep 20 and then we charge the owner a um, $7 booking fee on top. So we we'll end up on a $107 transaction, we end up with $27 um, in terms of um, fees. And then um, MadPost uh, Food Health, as well as Joy, really kind of subscription fees. Um, Dinner Bowl, we've uh, um, started that business uh, and it's, it's one business that certainly is gonna grow in terms of margins as well. Uh, with scale, we're doing a lot of work here at the moment on the operational side, and I'll, I'll go through that in a second as well. Um, MadPaws Insurance is a recurring revenue stream for every, every insurance that we um, sell. We, um, we get a 20% annuity revenue here, and MadPaws Joy is the toys and treats box. Uh, that's already running at 40% margins now for a delivered box. Uh, we've got very sticky customers. Um, and we see a huge opportunity for this business to grow further. Um, again, everything that we do, we're focusing on cross-selling between the different businesses. On the, on, the, um, on the technology side, we're really working hard to connect these businesses closer and make it easier for us to, A, have a single view of our customer, that we know what people are buying, what they're interested in, what their data is, um, so that we can then put the right products in front of them at the right time. <laughs> and I, I thought I'd give you a quick overview of our quarterly results. They've, um, we've released them just the other week. Um, you know, very, very happy with the results. Um, uh, bookings and transactions, uh, 53,000 up 81% year on year with a GMV of uh, 6.1 million, which was up 74%. Um, and an operating revenue of over $2 million for the quarter, which was up over uh, nearly 200% uh, year on year. Um, some of the key ones, marketplace revenue, um, for the first time, a million dollars for the quarter, which was up 63%. And, you know, this obviously still given that um, we had uh, um, a, a little bit of slowdown with uh, some of the states like Western Australia and Queensland borders um, still being closed, um, as well as Omicron, you know, um, being top of mind, particularly uh, towards the end of the quarter. So, you know, we've, we've seen huge growth here for, for the business. Um, and we see, you know, additional growth coming there once we get into kind of a more normal state uh, in terms of travel for the marketplace. Um, we still had nearly $9 million cash on hand um, at the end of the quarter, which allows us to um, further grow um, and fund the, the, the strategies that we have. And, oops, sorry, let's see, too fast. And so a couple of details just on, um, on the results. So uh, already talked about quarterly bookings uh, year on year, 81% up. You can see uh, in Q4 21, uh, 2020, 
you can see the drop, um, which was obviously impacted by um, the marketplace. Um, just to give you an idea in terms of timing as well, um, the additional revenue streams, we kind of really started at the beginning of COVID. We used um, you know, the time that we had at that time where the marketplace was quiet, because people were obviously locked uh, at home. Um, we used that time to um, invest into the additional revenue streams. And I think that's the story you can see in the numbers here. Um, that even though we had, you know, in, in um, Q1 as well as Q, uh, sorry, Q3, 21 as well as Q1, 22, we had additional uh, lockdowns. You could see that the, um, the booking slowdown has been significantly less. And uh, on the right hand side, um, GMV growth has been significantly higher, which obviously is, a, is an advantage of the additional revenue streams um, underpinning the business. New customer growth, we had a record month if you take out the Wagner acquisition in Q4 for Q2 22. So just shows you how many pet owners are out there and looking, looking for our, for our um, services. And then on the right hand side, that's really the story of the additional revenue streams as well. Uh, you can see continuous um, revenue growth up to $2 million for the quarter, um, even though there were um, lockdowns throughout the time. And to give you an idea, Q2, last 12 months, um, uh, GMV was $16.6 million, uh, um, which was an increase of 104% um, to the period before that. So, um, you know, fast, the, the strategy is really working. The, the new revenue streams are kicking in, um, and we see some significant growth uh, for, for, for the marketplace itself, but also for the additional revenue streams, uh, streams that we're building. And then just uh, to, um, finishing up, just a quick outlook of kind of what we are um, um, looking to do over the over the um, over the next couple of months. Um, with the uh, marketplace, we're really focused on building our flywheel. Right. So this means for us more owners, more matches, which means we've got more data, which results in better matches, uh, which will ultimately result in more bookings. And the marketplace, as I said, is for us the engine room with over fifteen thousand transactions a month giving us the opportunity to scale our other businesses faster, right? So this is something we know how to grow. Um, we've been working on it for a long time. We're really excited about the opportunities with travel now normalizing. We've already seen our, um, our uh, booking numbers go up in terms of customer bookings, but we're also seeing our average GMVs coming back. And that's a result of international travel slowly picking up again. And so we really see a, um, a double bunny for us here coming, coming forward where Booking numbers will trend upwards like they have been over the last couple of quarters. Uh, and the average GMV um, returning to pre-COVID numbers as well, uh, which could, should give us accelerated growth. Um, pet product subscription offerings. Um, we're really working on the leading subscription platform here. Um, and so I've talked about Crosshair before. That is for us not just a marketing activity, it's really also a technology activity. We want to make sure that we've got a platform that supports our cross-sell. Um, uh, uh, strategies that we have, and we're investing heavily in that um, over this quarter and next quarter. Pet life cycle management, health um, as a key focus. So um, I've already talked about this before, but our customers are very close to their pets. They're very interested, not just in making sure that they look after well, but that they also feed them well. Uh, and the next addition to that is obviously making sure that they don't have any issues, you know, growing old and grow as old as, as possible to be with the families for as long as possible. So we see a huge opportunity to really um, uh, uh, invest more and, and give our customers um, more options in the um, supplements and um, medication space over the next couple of months. Um, and then curated e-commerce already talked about this. Uh, we've now got a logistics setup that we're uh, utilizing. We've got a warehouse that, house, um, that houses all of our um, uh, uh, brands under one roof, which gives us a huge opportunity to uh, cross-sell, upsell into the different boxes. Uh, and um, when we're looking to utilize that, that logistics setup we have now. points um, but um, we've already started seen a, a great start to the year um, even though Omicron has obviously in, uh, significantly impacted the marketplace market price has still been growing 45 percent um, compared to uh, last year so you know with all that on mind we're still very happy with where we are and um, the opportunity ahead of us
And then last but not least, just wanted to um, reiterate the huge tailwinds that we have and, and why we've kind of never been in a better place for accelerated growth um, over the next couple of months. Pet ownership, we touched on. Uh, pet humanization um, is really what we're seeing. Um, you know, when we're talking to customers, we talk to customers every, every week, every day, and, um, and customers are uh, more and more concerned about their pets and, and, and how they can make sure that they're healthy and, and, and thriving. Huge industry, and um, COVID has obviously accelerated that shift from offline to online. Right? Um, that is something that helps us and will help us over the next uh, couple of quarters and years. Uh, we talked about the pent up demand uh, and how travel is kind of coming back now, um, and that will help us in, on the marketplace and therefore for all the other businesses um, that we are that we are touching on. Um, and then last but not least. Um, We've got uh, growing recurring revenue streams from Dinner Ball and Wagley, uh, which really gives us a, a um, much safer base in terms of you know, whether there's gonna any, any other kind of um, lockdowns happening over the next couple of months. Uh, those businesses are not uh, impacted by, by lockdowns. We're actually seeing, if anything, a positive um, result of that. And then last but not least, uh, a very strong balance sheet with nearly $9 million at the end of the year to further invest into our growth strategy. And I think with that, uh, we're gonna to go to the Q&A. Uh, thanks, Justice. Um, I think people are a little tired after all the tennis, but I'll kick off with maybe the first question. I just wanted to go back to the, the premiumization you were talking about and the, the spend uh, per annum on dogs and cats. I think it was like, 3,200 and a little over 2,000. Uh, have you got any data on, obviously, pet ownership you've referenced as like shot up in the pandemic, but how fast is that spend growing? Is it is it growing at, you know, are people spending 10% more per annum over the last like four or five years? Have you, have you got any stats on how the, the growth rate in the, in the spend per annum is going? Yeah, so um, there's, there's some good data from the same report pre- pandemic mm -hmm. and um i'd be lying if i know the exact percentage now but um the percentage if you look at kind of the 2019 report which was the last report i think before the pandemic and compared to this one um the spend per pet has gone up um you know by 20 to 30 percent um between cats and dogs so you know it's not it's not a very slow increase uh, that's something that's increased significantly and and we obviously see that we, and when we talk to our customers as well because the focus is so much stronger on their pets now, right? People spend a lot of time now at home. Uh, a lot of people are spending more time now at home with working from home or only part-time working from home, only having to go to the office a couple of days a week. Um, but ultimately that's the opportunity for us, right? Um, some people will still have to go back to the office. So they've got to find um, a, uh, you know, something um, to somebody to look after their pet. Um, which is why we've seen daytime services, daycare, um, significantly increase, increase over the last couple of months and quarters. Um, and then obviously, you know, people much more aware of kind of their, their pets' um, well-being and, um, and start thinking, you know, start seeing some of the trends that we've seen for humans with, you know, we've, we've all been... Sure that you give them quality um quality food i've got a couple of questions in justus from the audience um what are you doing to reduce leakage on the core pet sitting platform yeah i'm guessing you know people are seeing what you're doing and uh, it's probably attracting competition so how do you retain customers in that core business yeah good question and and um you know like any marketplace we obviously have leakage um and i think you know the the, the, the any marketplace kind of um, battles a little bit with, with leakage. I think we've got to actually very we're in a very good position to to target that. So, you know, I think what, what the question is about probably is uh, somebody finds a sitter on uh, on Madpost, does the first transaction through Madpost, and then and then takes um, you know if there's repeat business, uh, they take it offline. Now, um, 
some stats around that. So um, our repeat business is already 70% of our total revenue on the marketplace. So, and that has been um, um, continuously growing, which is obviously what we want to see. Um, and it's great to see, even though we, we're adding much more new customers to the business, right? So that's very healthy. And then um, in terms of what we're doing to mitigate that problem, uh, we're doing a couple of things. Uh, some of them are your, your standard um, kind of hygiene product. So, so, you know, have a good product, make it super easy for the customer, um, offer insurance. You know, those are the things that we are obviously doing. Um, so every transaction is going through the marketplace is insured, uh, which is a, is a huge, is a huge um, point, not just for owners, but also for sitters, right? Because the sitter is ultimately responsible for the, for the pet um, during the time of the sitting service, uh, which means if the dog runs in front of a car and the car drives into a Bentley, um, they essentially have to look and have to pay for that. Now, they normally don't have the right insurance for that. Going through our platform um, mitigates that. Um, but then, as I said, those are more kind of our hygiene factors. The, the key things that we're working on, and this is continuous improvement for us, is, the, is using data to actually identify the sitters that are doing the right thing by us on the platform. And so I mentioned we've got 30,000 sitters on the platform, um, but we've got over you know, kind of 12,000 power sitters on the platform as well. That's, those are sitters that are continuously using our platform. Um, and those are the ones that we want to identify. We can see in the data very clearly if somebody has great conversion rates on new customers, but then has a very weak um, uh, retention rate on the platform. And those sitters will automatically be deranked by our algorithm, um, and they will get less and less, um, less and less uh, uh, business from us, uh, up to the point where uh, where we also delist them from the from the platform. So that I think for us is the biggest lever in in how we can uh, mitigate or reduce leakage as much as we can, and um, and there's still you know improvements that we're working on uh, on a daily basis. And we've got two more we'll try and squeeze in before uh, we move on to our next presenter. Uh, first one, how many times does a customer use the pet sitting service um, in a year on average and probably the like average booking value? Yeah, sure. So if um, if we look like pre-COVID uh, um, and those numbers are, have changed a little bit because like I said, um, particularly through COVID, we had um, a bigger take up of some of the more daytime services because people weren't traveling. But if we if we look um, now, we're kind of having people using the service between um, two to four times. And it depends a little bit what service they use. Obviously, if you look at a, a dog walking service, you know that we've got customers that use the service twice a week. Um, where if you look at a customer that uses us only for holiday um, bookings, that will be um, significantly lower. One interesting point here to mention is not just the, the number of bookings, and I've already said 70% of our bookings are repeat bookings now, so there's a lot of repeats coming through. Um, but the other important thing is also the, the length of the booking, right? So, and um, uh, we, we call this kind of the, the, the number of um, time units per booking. And, and that's something we're seeing slowly coming back up. So that used to be around four in, in um, in holiday times, it, it was maybe even four and a half, five. Um, so essentially five nights, if you if you think about a, a, um, a holiday booking, five nights um, per booking, that has dropped through in COVID to under three and, and is now creeping back up and is nearly at four now again. So that's the what I've been talking about before is kind of that average GMV per booking. We've been now slowly increasing again, uh, seeing increase again. And to give you an average, uh, uh, an idea about the average booking value um, over all our marketplace um, um, services that is um, uh, has dropped in COVID to uh, just about $100. And um, pre-COVID was $180 in holiday times and, uh, and even higher, uh, if you're thinking about December, for example. Um, but now we're creeping back up um, and last December was over $170 again. So there's still some room and some growth there which is uh, why we think um, we see, you know, accelerated growth once international travel comes back even stronger. Okay, Justice, we've run out of time, but uh, thank you uh, for joining us this morning and uh, we'll keep an eye on the Mad Pause story as we move through 2022. Perfect. Thanks for having me.
Thank you. If you could just stop sharing your screen and then we'll hand over to Martin from Pure Profile, who I know is waiting patiently in the wings there. Good morning, Mark, and good morning, listeners. Uh, thank you very much for joining. So let me just open up now. It's coming through now and just go to full screen mode if you can. Yeah, there we go. Perfect, Martin, ready to go. All right, thank you very much, Mark. So what we'll run through is, uh, I've got Melinda Shepherd, our CFO also on this call, who will talk through some financial numbers. So what we're going to run through here is our um, quarter two and half one results that we uh, released uh, a week or so ago and uh, give you a flavor of the business. And at the end, please ask away any questions. So Pure Profile, for those of you who don't know, we are an insights and media company. What that means is uh, brands want to understand consumers' opinions, views, sentiments. Every product that you purchase, every advert that you see has gone through some sort of research. The brand has gathered some sort of insights. That's what Pure Profile does. And then 90% of all of those insights are so a brand can actually, or a government can actually get the right messages across to us through advertising campaign. And so we have a media arm, Pure Amplify, because we go from insights to activation. So that's what we do as a company. We help people understand consumers, and then we help people uh, target those consumers at the right place, right time, the right messages. And um, we're a 22 year old uh, company. We listed on the uh, ASX in 2016, uh, made a couple of acquisitions then, which didn't work out for us as a, as a business. Uh, Mel came on to uh, about three years ago to steady the, the ship and, and conduct a restructure, etc. And then I came on about 18 months ago and we did a recapitalization. And uh, along with Mel's restructure, the recapitalization, the fantastic team, um, it, it, we haven't looked back. So what do we do? Data and insights, as I said, we, we, how we make our money, three key ways. Data and insights, we enable organizations to understand their audiences, better decisions. How do we do that? We have 4 million consumers around the world who either share data, and so uh, brands can view data about what people have bought and uh, maybe what uh, websites they've gone to, et cetera, as well as um, delivering online surveys. So the, again, across those 4 million people, um, a brand can ask target audience, maybe BMW drivers or, or Volvo drivers or uh, Medibank insurance customers, et cetera, certain points, certain interests so that they can fine tune their products. The second area of business that we have is our self-service platforms. We have three key products. First product is Insights Builder, enables brands to um, access those 4 million people without picking up the phone to us, conducting their own research and then analyzing their own results. And people like Budget Direct, Adore Beauty, et cetera, Flybys use that Insights Builder. And then uh, the third area, oh, second product in self-service platform, excuse me, second product is Audience Builder. Audience Builder enables uh, companies that have large memberships actually to plug into those memberships to um, give them rewards for again sharing data or doing survey for um, gathering their own insights and then we do a revenue share at the back end so again customers that use that include News Corp, Flybys, Raise, AA Smart Fuel. we just signed a, a, a large one across age of 39 million people called the Asian parent so uh, big expansion across our audience Builder product. And then the third product is audience intelligence. And this is, uh, again, a SaaS product. Somebody, a brand can log into the SaaS product and they can view their competitors and their own uh, customer information, um, get an idea of how they're doing in a whole of market, how they're doing versus competitors by age, demographic, location, etc., uh, age, gender, uh, location, etc. And 
and people like Uber Eats you use that service. And then the, the, the third business unit is Pure Amplify Media. And Pure Amplify Media is execution of those campaigns. We do everything using first party data, not third party cookie, which has a lot of privacy concerns at the moment. Uh, it's becoming outlawed potentially in the, the US um, with new legislation that's being passed and so that puts us really well placed with um, first party data that we do all of our campaign planning on. So that's what we do as a business and that's how we make our money. Um, key clients that use us, again, this presentation will be made available at the moment. I'll focus on the strategy here. So <clears throat> 18 months ago, it was about, as I said, recapitalization and then actually focusing on the strategy of this 22 year old company. And so the first pillar is global business. So uh, we already had five offices around the world um, and I'll come to that slide in a moment. And it was about actually uh, making sure we are truly a global company. So all of those offices working in the same way, that if I'm a client, I'm a partner, I'm an employee, I have exactly the same experience, whether I'm in London or New York or Singapore, I have the same experience with um, pure profile and pure profile data. And then rolling out into new markets. Um, if you look at our full year presentation, it's not in this slide, but actually in both the insights and the media space, um, the UK market is 14 times bigger than the Australian market, and the US market is 44 times bigger than the Australian market for that. And as a company, our biggest market today with about 60% of our revenue is Australian market. So it's a about moving into where we have very low market share and actually growing that market share easily. And we'll talk about some st statistics that we're doing that. So the right investments in the right area growing globally. The second pillar is around technology. Um, again, uh, a high barrier to entry for us is proprietary technology, um, 22 years of, of development work, et cetera. Um, and then it was a case of actually doing a full audit of all of our technology, um, seeing what we perhaps could partner, what we could um, buy, what we could rent our use off the shelf versus developing it all ourselves. So we, we've been through the exercise uh, about six months audit and then 12 months or so of development work. And we're now rolling out new solutions um, in markets that perhaps are best of breed um, standard industry solutions rather than ones we've built ourselves. And again, that brings efficiency, speed, improves quality for all of our client delivery and then new client facing solutions. Um, audience intelligence, brand new product for us. We launched it in uh, April of last year. Uh, audience Builder made um, further enhancements to as we have Insights Builder. So developing the SaaS pro uh, products, building that internal efficiency and ensuring we've got client facing solutions which deliver what they want. Um, and then once you've grown globally, got the right technology, those two core divisions data and insights and our pure amplify teams are able to leverage off of that and, and grow and again mel will talk about the growth that we've seen um this last six months and again go to please our asx releases and you can see our growth every quarter throughout last year as well today we have offices in seven countries we have 767 clients Roughly, we have 767 clients globally, uh, 179 staff, uh, 31.6 million revenue is from repeat clients in the 12, past 12 months. We have a, approximately a 95% retention rate of clients. And then 5.8 million is in annuity revenue across the business in, in the last 12 months. Um, and again, annuity revenue is great. You, you, you start the year knowing exactly what revenue you're going to grow and uh, have and then grow that base. So uh, we opened Singapore um, last September. We opened mainland. 
around Europe um, last January, and actually not on this slide, but we'll do a, it's not price sensitive, and we'll, we'll do a, a press release in the next week. So we've literally just opened our, our Malaysian office again. So being able to deliver solutions for clients across all of those markets. And actually, it's, again, please, I refer back to that, but please go back to our uh, ASX presentations. We actually have delivered research in, in 93 countries in the last 12 months. People, phenomenally important to uh, us as a business. And we, we spend a, a lot of time, a lot of effort, quite rightly, ensuring that we've got the right people in the right locations. As an organization, um, we were about 90% COVID ready, added that extra 10% by adding reporting, some training for managers, a couple of new processes and systems. And today, literally, employees can work from anywhere in the world and, and work for Pure Profile. Um, so we just added somebody in Brisbane. We don't have a Brisbane office. They work for the Pure Amplify team. We've had an engineer in Adelaide, um, again, work, working for the business. We don't have an Adelaide office. Uh, remotely in the UK, north of England, our offices uh, are in London. Okay. We're very, very proud of the fact that um, we feel that we are an employer of choice today. And I know I conduct interviews and interviewees asking that interview, how often do I need to come in the office? You know, that, that's an unheard question a couple of years ago. And today it's actually a question that people are asking. People either want to work from home, maybe have moved away from capital cities, and that gives us the ability ability to really um, cherry pick the the best team members that we can around the world also um, we built out in effect a, a new executive team over um, 18 months ago and over that first six months and we've brought in a team of, of leaders from industry leaders around the world um, head of product for example uh, came from facebook um, competitors in our space um, head of innovation and data came from WPP, um, senior salespeople come from core competitors. And as I was saying to somebody the other day, we've, we've built this executive team, um, not of a, as we'll finish this year, approximately $40 million of revenue, which Mel will go through, not of that, but actually we've built an executive team that can do a $100 million plus as a, as a business. So got a great team that is now executing. As this slide talks about, um, really diverse organisation, um, gender, nationality, age, uh, and that support and that voice everybody feels have, uh, feel they have is reflected in that employee satisfaction, which um, was 83% in our Pulse survey we just completed. Anything above 78 is a, a world-class company and actually we uh, a few months ago now completed great place to work in Australia and uh, our uh, employee satisfaction was no, we scored 98 out of 100 on on that so as an organization we've got high employee satisfaction and high client uh, engagement and again our, our client engagement scores are about 80 um, six and and anything above uh, 73 is is world class um, so again, you've got those two high revenues will follow and to uh, make everybody feel a part of the business and the part of the growth of the organization, we rolled out an employee equity plan uh, in March 21. Um, which gave people options and, and it really feels like the now everybody is part of the success of the business. And so with that, I am just going to hand over to Mel. Wonderful. Thanks, Martin. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to share our Q2 and our half one uh, results. Uh, these are unaudited and obviously preliminary at this point in time. Uh, in the last week of February, we will be releasing our audited uh, half year results and financial statements. Uh, we'll also give you a, 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 a look into how Q3 is going. So we'll be sharing our January results with you also over that um, in the February update. So we had a great quarter in Q2 following off the momentum we built in Q1. Our revenue was up 31% to 10.6 million uh, for the quarter. EBITDA was 1.4 million, which was a whopping 82% up. And uh, 
Also, our net operating cash flow was again positive at 900,000, which was 386% up. Um, from a business unit perspective, um, all our revenue lines were up year on year. You can see here our APAC region for data and insights was up 14%. Uh, the growth in the UK, EU and US was up 48% to 2.6 million. Our SaaS platform was 1 million for the quarter, which was 383% up. And our Pure Amplify media business, which is in Australia and in the UK, was 1.7 million or 16% up year on year. If you go to the next slide, please, Martin. So for the half, so it was a record revenue and EBITDA half for Pure Profile. Um, if you exclude all the discontinuing businesses that we've sold off. So for, from a like for like basis, one would say. So for the half, our revenue was up 44% year on year to 20.8 million. Our EBITDA was two and a half million, which was 53% up. And our net operating cash flow was 1.6 million for the half or 829% up. If normalize EBITDA, so... Year, 3.5 million, 46% up year on year. And um, also our closing cash at bank was 4.7 million, which was actually 52% up on the prior comparable period. So at 31st of December last year, not long after we did the recapitalization, we had 3.1 million. Um, looking 12 months forward, the cash at bank's gone up to 4.7 million. Just a, other, a couple of other notes to sort of talk about as well is I know many of you are quite interested in our, um, our EBITDA margin. What's that looking like? How's it changed? And I'm really pleased to say that we've seen um, an improvement in our EBITDA margin for the half from 5% uh, in FY20 to 7% in FY21. And for this half in FY22, it was 12%. So you can see that the continued improvement in margin as we grow our revenue invest back in the business, but you're starting to see um, that, that a dollar of revenue, more of that falling to the bottom line. And that's a, a trend that you'll continue to see over, over the coming years as well. If you go to the next slide, Martin. Just uh, showing you some of the trends uh, for the quarter, um, very consistent to what we've been showing over um, prior periods as well. So again, that top line revenue growth that you really didn't see in prior years, you're starting to see now across all revenue lines. The SaaS platform significantly growing as we've um, in, introduced a, a number of new products, such as the audience builder product, audience intelligence product, etc. Et and then the EBITDA um, it is very consistent, the growth going from FY19 up to um, FY22. Half one financial trends. Um, it, it very similar again, um, that continued momentum from a revenue perspective and an EBITDA. Um, next slide. Um, and this is my favorite slide. Um, after being with the business for, for qu quite a few years where we did have an incredibly tight cash flow. Um, I'm so thrilled to see that, you know, we're continuing to grow that, that the revenue is translating through to cash and, um, and that's fantastic for us. We've now had six consecutive growth, um, quarters of growth in cash receipts. So um, I think this is actually such a, an important slide for all of us. And, and for me, it certainly gives me a lot of comfort that we're going in the right direction as an organisation. And next slide. And that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mel. And obviously, at the end, any questions um, can be put to, to Mel and myself about this. Um, so let's have a look at a few operating. A <clears throat> couple of key operational performance uh, measures that we look at. Um, firstly, I talked about global being a key part of our um, key pillar of our strategy. 45% increase in revenue um, from businesses outside of Australia with over a hundred new clients. So that's absolutely key. 383% uh, quarter and quarter revenue.
So growing globally, growing our SaaS platform and uh, keeping high engagement with our clients and employees so that we just, any new client we win is growing on that existing base that we have. Some uh, key clients that uh, used our insights um, during half one, all brands that you can recognize, uh, uh, Nine, Foxtel, McDonald's, uh, Lavazza, YouTube, uh, Under Armour. Um, in actual fact, 20% today of the ASX 200 uses um, Pure Profile and either directly or through uh, media or research agencies, sort of like the Intel inside. Um, working with us. So um, that continues to grow household brands you can all recognize. We must be doing something right. Talked about audience builder a little bit. So just have a look at the, that in some more detail. So this is a SaaS solution for brands to increase loyalty, develop insights, generate revenue. Um, key brands today using us, you recognize these names. I've seen News Corp, Flybys, Rays, uh, AA Smart Fuel, Singapore, SGAG. Um, we just signed uh, Asian Parent and I go Asian Parent across Asia and I go direct in, in Australia. And it's a great way for us to accelerate growth in new markets. Um, where we can immediately launch with a, a partner, it gives us scale and gives us efficiency because we do a back end revenue share, means we don't have to uh, recruit those data points of those individuals up front and immediately can start generating revenue with clients. <clears throat> so, our <clears throat> audience builder solutions, um, again, in quarter two, 152 million points were rewarded to community members in that quarter. And as I said, we signed, I go direct in Australia and the Asian parent, really exciting, based out of Singapore. They're in 11 countries across Southeast Asia and Africa. And it gives us the ability to do even more for clients in those markets. And especially timely with us just opening up the Malaysian office. And <clears throat> What was our progress to date? Well, as said, growing globally, 59% growth in data points panelists outside of Australia. Uh, that enables us to grow the revenues, 1.6 million in new client revenue from regions outside of Australia, and 51% growth in total revenue from regions outside of Australia. So tick, growing globally. More data, more insights. So existing Partnerships data is increased by 70% in half two, directly correlates to us being able to increase revenues uh, and increase margins, as Mel just talked about. And we have exciting new uh, international partnership discussions, which are in progress. These discussions take 12 months or so, and they're now starting to come to a fore and you, to, to, to the end, and you will see other countries rolling out. <clears throat> our SaaS and technology, so trials with clients across retail and the quick service restaurants, verticals in audience intelligence, and again, audience builder, close contracts with uh, I go direct and the Asian parents. Next uh, six months, <clears throat> we'll see developing new partnerships, technology launches, we've got a number of new solutions um, being rolled out, and we'll talk about those um, when we have a full audited results in February, and that'll be a more detailed presentation. Um, and that will talk about new technology solutions that we've rolled out, especially uh, in this month, especially tomorrow. I've just seen a product list of new solutions that are being ready to be rolled out tomorrow. And then continue that global business growth. So really focused on expanding our Southeast Asia and UK businesses, adding those sales resources, business support um, to uh, meet all of our client need. So in summary, continue strong growth. Mel just touched on um, at least six quarters of uh, cash flow growth and business growth that we've seen, accelerated EBITDA and operating cash flows. We uh, add efficiencies and every line that you see our EBITDA and our free cash is growing at a greater percentage to our revenue. And that's as we become better and smarter at what we're doing as a, as a business. New audience builder, SaaS partners, 
Um, fantastically, highly engaged, amazing employees that I'm proud to work with and really loyal and satisfied clients. And that is our Monday morning presentation. Thank you, everybody. Back to you, Mark. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, I just first question from me. The, the various offices I noticed on that slide that um, some of them are offering, you know, three of the services, some of them are offering one or two of the services. Is the plan to have every office offering all three services into the market that, uh, that offers services? Or is that by design that some offices only do one or two services? Yeah, really well spotted, Mark. It's just timing. So typically in a market, we launch first with the data and insights solution, um, which is the survey type offering. Uh, it's an $89 billion market around the world. As I said earlier, we've, we've delivered research in 93 countries in, in the last 12, uh, last 12 months. And so we have a brand, we have the knowledge, full infrastructure set up. That's the easiest one to launch with. Then on the back of that, um, the next one typically we launch is our SaaS solutions, because again, the same clients that, uh, well, not all of the same, but typically the same clients that want to do surveys also want to um, carry out something like Audience Builder or uh, Insights Builder, do their own surveys or do audience intelligence. So most of our clients use uh, those solutions across the business. And then finally, we launch our activation pure amplify team so that I go from insights to activation. So yes, we roll that across the market uh, and uh, all of the products are fully linked and actually are there for a reason. Again, a client wants to um, understand the uh, why, so why does somebody buy a product? Why does somebody um, interested or respond to an ad? What does somebody think about uh, a product, etc.? They do that, then they go to the absolute what. So uh, again, how am I comparing to my competitors? What are the volumes of my business or competitors' business in different geographies? So I've gone from why to what, and then I go to the execution. So as a business that is seamless, and we have clients that use all three different business verticals for us. And then a, a follow-on question to that, should we expect more offices uh, to roll out over the next 12 or 24 months. I know has uh, South America didn't have its own dedicated office. I'm guessing it's service from the North American office. Uh, and then, or would it be a case of, you know, in mainland Europe, you have a specific office for some of the larger countries rather than servicing the whole region from, from one office? Martin, can you hear me? So we just, uh, when we open a new office, we just had commercial client facing people. They're then supported by a hub, either Australia or um, Europe or UK, sorry. And then um, we have a, a large offshoring center in India with a client does manual work instead of using our SaaS products. So we literally just roll out commercial people. I would uh, hope this year that uh, France, Germany, um, and then perhaps a, another Southeast Asian market on, on top of Malaysia. Key focus really those growing out that UK business. UK will equate to about uh, 13, 14 million this year of our 40 or so million dollars of revenue. And that should be bigger than our Australian business. So we're adding commercial people um, to ensure that that grows the, the fastest. So it's English language, we've already got 19 or so people in the market, strong brand, been there about eight years. So it makes sense that that's the market we grow the fastest. Sorry, I was just about to say that nicely finishes is exactly on time. So we will leave it there. Martin, thanks very much for coming back in and giving us a, an update on all things Pure Profile. And uh, yeah, we look forward to the expanded presentation when the half year results come out um, the back end of February.
Brilliant. Thank you for having us again, Mark. Yeah, yeah thanks, and Mark. I should yeah, and thank Melinda for joining us as well. Uh, with that, I'll finish this morning's webinar and uh, wish everybody a good rest of their Monday and a good week.